in sync with what you're talking. Okay. There's some blinky LEDs that go blinky blinky every time you talk. That's that sounds okay. that sounds good. All right. So we're good to go. Yay! Thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone. Thanks uh, for coming to the talk. Um, I c this paper is about what I just call it the, the Q3A CTF paper or the Quake 3 UNICEF paper because the actual name, Human Level Performance in First Person Multiplayer Games and Population Based Deep Reinforcement Learning, takes a bit too long to say. So I just call it the Q3A CTF paper. And that's what I say that I send my Dropbox just to find it. I, I will never remember that name in any case. So um, I, my name is Dave, Dave Ungerer. Um, that's my email address. By day, I run a software company that I founded, and by night, I learn about machine learning stuff. So I'm not a professional in the field, but I've been doing quite a bit of learning on it. So for the past three months, I've been trying to learn quite a bit about machine learning when I have time. And before that, I, I was just trying to learn about artificial intelligence in general. So I think at this point, I might have enough knowledge to do this paper justice, but I probably won't be able to answer all the hard technical questions. Um, not even close, but hopefully I can give you guys some uh, good uh, knowledge of the paper. Okay. Um, so who's played Quake 3 Arena CTF? All right, so a few of us, cool. So for those who haven't, um, there's a quick little embedded video that just gives you an idea. Now, when you see this, okay, let me, sorry, let me first say what the paper is really about before I jump into this. So, the paper is about teaching um, agents, or not teaching, but allowing them to teach themselves how to play this game, which, in, which is a team game where you're competing against another team and you have teammates and everything is driven by, the training is driven by on-screen pixels and rewards. So it's not like when the game is released, obviously you could play it against bots. This was in the 90s and it was released with bots. But these bots actually hooked into the internal game logic and they knew what was happening in the game. And they actually had perfect knowledge. So they could actually, you know, see through walls in theory if they wanted to. So they could, they could outsmart you in various ways. Whereas these bots that are trained in this paper only, can only see what humans can see. So the game d doesn't look like this normally. So uh, what they did is they took the, the Quake 3 Reno engine. It's the same engine with the same mechanics. They just simplified a few things. So they generated s slightly simpler maps. They're all procedurally generated. So they all r th so they only just train them on one map because obviously all the bots will learn, or the agents will learn one map and not be able to generalize. Normally the, the maps look much more comp. You can see there the structured sort of um, perf always perf well, they should be symmetric normally, but it's also quite a simple structure as you can see there on the screen. And the graphics themselves, the graphics have been simplified quite a bit. And there's only one weapon, which is the railgun, and there's no ammunition pickups, no health pickups. So it's a bit simpler, but it's still the actual game. And I recently read on their um, site a few days ago, they posted they're actually trying this out on the full scale original Quake 3 in a map. So that's, so you'll probably be hearing more about this in the next year or two as well. So here's just a basic intro to the game. Um, so you run to the opponent's base. It's marked, it's red. So the opponent's base is the opposite color of yours. There's your teammate. So the blue right now is run by the machine? Yeah, we're seeing blue now. We're seeing through blue's first person perspective right now. And then blue must return the red flag to their base and then they, they score a point. So if the opponent has your flag, you, 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 shoot, you shoot at them and they'll, they'll drop it and it'll return to your base again. And that's the basic mechanics. So you, you score a point every time you capture the opponent's flag. And at the end of five minutes, the the team that that scored the most uh, flag captures is the winner of the game. All right. Um, so it's really a team thing, like any team sport. You, your individual performance, while important, isn't really what matters. And that's what actually what makes the paper. That's one of the things that makes the paper interesting, is this sort of emerging cooperation between agents. Um, without them having direct communication. So it's all implicit, sort of seeing your opponent is heading off and then thinking, well, maybe I'm not thinking, while well, being sort of 
probabilistically reasoning that maybe you should stay in the base and it all emerges um, over the over the period of, of the training um, the other thing that I find interesting about the paper is the fact that um, it's the whole first person thing is is a it's a very good area to develop for machine learning in general because hopefully eventually machines will be able to learn in the way that we learn about our natural environment just having a camera where we have eyes, so sort of learning in that way. So that's why I f what another thing I find interesting. So on that note, here's another um, version. Of, so there are two versions of the maps, all right? Here's the second version of the map. So they used, the one was the indoor that you just saw. The second is the outdoor, and it's slightly more complicated because it has a bit more visual interference and a bit of elevation and stuff. So let me show you that one. And the other thing you should notice is that you might notice that the motion of the agent is slightly jittery. They're kind of doing like going like a, they're not moving as smoothly as a human player might move. And you'll see in a bit that that's because of the the way they structured the controls is they didn't give the agent the option to move at in a, on a continuous interval. And I can only assume that's a limitation of the, the 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 training algorithm at this point. They couldn't. The agent has to pick to move a little bit or a lot to to the side. It it can't actually pick exactly how much it wants to move. So that was that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Uh, okay, okay. So that's what the actual game looks like normally, and so you can see they simplified it a bit, um, but it is. Um, so, the, so whereas you saw the the the, the, the teammates and, and opponents that we just saw, they kind of were somewhat symmetrical, um, spherical. S that's spherical symmetry. Axis, sorry, axial symmetry. Um, and so, if they were looking the opposite way or whatever, they kind of looked the same. So that's kind of a bit easier to recognize for for a neural network than than this, because now if this if this player were to be pointed the, the opposite way or to the left or the right, that would actually be, um, uh, it'll require more training to, to, to recognize this versus the other sorts of players. So that's another simplification. Um, okay, so does everyone know what reinforcement learning is? Okay, well, so I'll just spend one or two minutes just talking about the reinforcement learning aspect. So all, all that is, your agent really doesn't have a model of how the environment works. Um, so it's given states um, and has to make decisions. Like that's, that part is not specific to reinforcement learning. But what happens here is it doesn't actually know um, how its actions will be rewarded until it receives the reward. So that's reinforcement learning. Um, and there's, here's the hello world of reinforcement learning is the cart pole problem. And that is just, you have a pole in the cart, and if it falls too far to the side, you, you lose. So you get a sec you get one re reward point for every second you hold it upright. And if you go too far to the sides, you, your episode ends. And then you, so you get maybe held for three seconds, you get three points. So the goal is to get like as many points as you can. So, so it's a, it's, that's like the hello world of reinforcement learning. And it's, it's not a difficult one. You can, pl you can apply the simplest algorithms to it but it illustrates the concept. So it's kind of learning and then eventually it learned how to balance this thing without knowing anything about physics or anything. It just got inputs about the angle of the pole and um, it was able to move it to the left or the right. Okay. So you're optimizing, in this case, if you had a neural network, you would optimize the um, how well you predict the rewards. That's what you're trying to optimize. Um, any questions so far? Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, whoa, sorry, okay. Okay, so then I just want to quickly talk about reward shaping for a bit because that's one of the things that they mention in the paper and it kind of, it's one of the things that they, they build on as well. So in this game we had the, we had the winning the game, like I said, is a, is a team sport and it's like a soccer game where you only win the game at the end of both halves right that's when you won the game and no one cares how many goals you scored if you didn't win right no, no one cares about all those individual stats the the big thing that's important is is the end result the thing with that is these games are five minutes long 
and um, these agents, so the, this cart pull problem I just showed you, the feedback is quite immediate because after three seconds, if you couldn't balance it, you immediately know you didn't do a good job and you can try again and again and again. But in this case, you have a sparse reward um, problem, which means after five minutes, you find out whether you lost the game or not. And now you have to think back, you know, so to speak, over the past five minutes and figure out what did you do to win or lose? And that's a very difficult thing to solve because all these actions are building on each other. And it's a whole chain of actions. So it's incredibly difficult. And they actually tried that f as a in this paper and the agent didn't learn anything when they just had the final reward um, as, the, as the final match um, outcome as a reward. The agents could not learn anything. Um, so yeah. So the re reward shaping, and they, they, they use the variation of reward shaping for the final agent, which is called the, the for the win agent, or FTW agent. It's sort of an, a more, a, a more a, it's, they call it um, reward, um, it's like a learned reward function. I can't remember the exact name right now, but it's like a learned reward function. So it's a bit more advanced in reward shaping. But they also use reward shaping for some of the simpler versions that they compared this to in the ablation of, of this. So they, 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 they compared with the baseline, they would have some reward shaping. And then with their version of it, they had something a bit more advanced for the final version. So the reward shaping is essential because the agents couldn't learn without it. And I'll explain to you now how the reward shaping actually worked. So this will show you how the reward shaping worked. So on the right there, you'll see W quake. And those are the points that, that the game actually comes out by the default. So players do get points, um, just, you know, just like soccer stats or whatever, but it, it, it doesn't impact the outcome of the game. It's still about who, who captured the most flags. But players do get points in, in, in Quake. So you get six if you as an individual capture the flag. So because of the re reward shaping, um, if you were doing reward shaping, you would then get the the six points as a um, and then you would be able to reinforce whatever behavior was was there um, and and that's how they can they can learn so so the, so they get the pixels and they on the screen and they get this but they don't so this is what they get in the some the sort of the the baseline type agent but in their agent they slightly tweaked it so they did introduce one two three four five six seven things that weren't actually in quake so there wasn't a reward um, for being tagged with or without the flag. There wasn't a reward, and obviously it can be a negative reward in, in that case. Um, there wasn't a reward for the team teammate picking up the flag or returning the flag. Um, there wasn't some sort of a negative reward for the, when the opponent captured the flag. So they did actually introduce this as well. So it's slightly more information than, than what's in the, in the actual quake, but it's not, it's not a lot. So in their agent, what they did is they sampled um, a sort of reward function that looked so if you look at those p values in the in the list there um, those are the base ones and then they're just sampled with the log uniform distribution so they kind of tried to what the agent is supposed to do is to learn to weight these things differently so the the, the w so not just straight reward shaping but learning which rewards to place more value on and it'll constantly place that value on that interim reward. Th that's what it's doing. So it will learn that p perhaps being tagged with the flag is worse than being tagged without the flag. All right. So and it can learn that, but over time as it tweaks the the, the weightings and it learns the weightings. Um, any questions on that? So the, the W weightings were gi were pre-programmed into the agents. Uh, the W the W weightings were uh, actually if you or if you're in Quake and you press Tab, okay. and it brings up like a scoreboard of okay. the teams and the players, those are the points that you that you actually see there in the original game. So it'll be the accumulation of those. That's what you see in the game. But we did the did the agents know about these? As in, this is how you rate everything, or were they just given? As in, did they know all the other points, or what the, what the points just given to them when they performed an action? Yeah. So they didn't know the meaning of the points. Right. 
the, the, the points weren't attached to a meaning of any sort, and it didn't tell the agent you're getting this point because you right. captured the flag. So you just got the points when yeah. you captured yeah. the flag. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So they right. get a reward, no idea why. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that's they, they were doing their stuff, and then randomly they just get whatever. And they get points. Exactly. And then it, what you're talking about is it's up to them to then try to figure out what that implies, in a way. Or what the, the, the point implies. Yes. Yeah, so then, so then, when they get the point, they need to then see what, how can I reinforce yeah. the, um, the action mm -hmm. or the set of actions that led to me getting a reward, regardless of why, uh, like what the reward actually means. Yeah, that's it. All right. Um, okay. Then another. So population-based training. That's actually in the title of the paper. So I thought we might want to want to cover it. It's, it's one of those ideas that's, that's actually quite simple when you see it. Um, and I, I think I read quite a bit of the population-based training paper. Not like I'm not sure if I read even half of it, but I did read enough to form a good honest, uh, okay, so understanding of it. So with this, obviously, they, you need to put a lot of computing power into this, and you want a lot of, do a lot of iterations of training your, your agents. And so you, the first thing you could do is the sequential, but that doesn't really scale. So you can't do Google scale, Google scale machine learning by doing something in sequence, seeing if it works or not, and then throwing it away and trying again, right? So maybe you hit some sort of a local um, minimum in, 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 in minimizing your loss function or something. And then when you figure that out, you start again with new hyperparameters, and you start learning, you re-initialize your weights to something else of your network, and you try again. Um, then there's a different approach, which is, which is parallel random grid search, where you just do a bunch of these sequential things all in one, uh, all simultaneously, maybe using throwing a lot of computing power at, at it, and then at the end, you pick the one that performed the best. So what population-based training is, is it's, it's also running a lot of things in parallel, but um, it has this notion of um, at any point an agent can be replaced by something better. So any underperforming agent can be replaced and it doesn't have to happen at any set time. So let's see if I've got a slide on the details of this. Yeah, so it's asynchronous. So whereas maybe in this parallel case you would just train them all and then at the end compare them, the population-based training is asynchronous, so at any point you can sort of do some sort of comparison between them. So every member needs to expose how well it's doing, so in other words, how many games it's won, as well as it's the, the weights in its neural network and the hyperparameters it was using. Um, then, if you're underperforming, so let's so it can figure out. Um, so periodically, your every agent will look at a, another random agent, compare itself and see what its win probability will be against that agent. If the probability is less than 30%, then the, this, the agent gets replaced. And it, what happens is a better agent is chosen. Uh, well, if that other agent was better, that agent is chosen. And then um, the, the weights and the hyperparameters and the internal rewards that we were just discussing, we were talking about the reward shaping. So the internal rewards is the more advanced form of the reward shaping. So how it learned to value different sort of um, things is, um, is, 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 is also copied. OK. OK. But this is still trying to improve learning, right? This is not inter-agent <coughs> communication of sorts. Yeah, this so. This is still figuring out one agent, as in improve, training a single agent at the end of the day. Or do you have, because you talked about let's say there's five players, right? And how do they communicate with each other? So this is not that part yet. No, so this, so I'll get to that. I think I'll get to that now, how they actually train it. So there's 30 agents being trained simultaneously. Yeah. Okay, and I'll get to, maybe I'll skip ahead a few slides. Um, okay, so let me just talk about the two-tier optimization that they're doing. Or I can skip ahead and see if there's anything. Yeah, there's a training detail. So I'll, okay. I'll go back to those slides for a bit. So. There is a hundred, oh, sorry, there's a thousand nine hundred and twenty game processes that are that are running um, simultaneously. Okay, um, <laughs> but that's games, right? Yeah. So there's that many games running. Um, every game is four players, not so two per side. 
Um, now they did say that that's how they train them, but they also happened to generalize to three in the team. Also worked with the same, seemed to work with the same. I don't think they retrained them for three in the team. I think that actually just worked. Um, like I said before, every game is five minutes. The um, agents are given 15 observations per second and then can do 15 actions per second. Um, the game actually runs at, can run at 60 frames per second, but I don't think the internal logic actually runs that fast, but the visuals can run at 60, 60 hertz. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so if you work it out, if you work out the fact that you only have 30 models that you're training, but there's 1,920 processes, that means 1,920 times 4 is the number of actual a um, agents that are playing. If you divide that by 30, I think you get to every agent, every agent or every model is being used in 256 games. So they're taking part in, this, uh, in the 256 games, and the results are being streamed back to this one agent of all the games that it's playing, and it can then use that information to up to do its um, its back propagation, all the stuff that you need to do for machine learning. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm just curious for your hardware. What hardware you're using in order to run this at this at, 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 at this kind of rate? What are they using? Yeah, the hardware, yeah. Oh, I actually they, they didn't they, they didn't um, specifically. I don't think that they mentioned specifically what they were doing in the paper, to be honest. But I do know that um, some of the stuff that, the, that that's happening, like the, the, the LSTMs and things, are a bit, a bit more difficult to do on, on, um, on TPUs, so the Google TPUs. So it's, it's not as easy to do on those, so they might have just had to use a bunch of GPUs. But I can't tell you how many. Um, I guess someone is Googling it right now to see if they can find it. <laughs> That's a lot. It was Steve Research, right? Sorry? It's this university research. What? University what? research. Is it, was it a university who did this? Or? Oh, this was DeepMind. DeepMind, okay. Yeah, this was DeepMind. So, so, and all the cited well, papers, the the most yeah. of the cited papers were also Deep, DeepMind. So, um, you'll, you'll see when I, when I get to okay. those. So, the agents, now I, say, I use the word wall clock playing time. I'm not sure I should have said wall clock pay, playing time. Maybe I should have said um, sort of actual game time. So the total game time that each of the agents were trained with is, they were trained for 450,000 games, which is about, f rough calculation, 4.3 years of, of playing time. Um, these FDW, for the win agents as well as the, the lower baseline agents were all trained with, with uh, that much. But um, it did reach average human performance after 120,000 games and I eyeballed the graph and it, uh, uh, I eyeballed the graph to get to 120,000 so that's roughly 1.14 years and strong human level <laughs> after 1.71 years of Game time. So that's game time. So, I mean, if you have good GPUs and you have enough of them, you can obviously do that in a reasonable amount of time, but still I'm not sure how long that took. Um, I'm not sure there's anything else on this slide, so I think we can go back to the, the previous slides. What was the three observations per second? What was that? Sorry. Uh, per sequence. So, so there's something else. So there's an auxiliary network for, and we probably won't go into the details because I'm also not too clear on all the details, but basically the reward prediction auxiliary network is doing a experience replay. Um, so it stores a bunch of past experiences that it can use to do another batch of gradient descent. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so the two-tier optimization is an empty slide because I just quickly want to talk through it. I didn't do a slide there, but the two-tier optimization is the fact that the, the, the bottom tier is the agent learning to optimize its own rewards. And then the higher tier is simply if your team doesn't win you and you keep on, your teams keep losing, you will be replaced right. by something better. So it's two tiers. Right. Okay. So you can't just be a... Win, I want to win myself. You want, you have to be a team player, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But the, that team behavior isn't well. It is somewhat programmed in, but you will evolve it eventually over time. As you sort of mutate those parameters, you will be more likely to make it to the. Yeah. You'll be more likely to pass <coughs> tier one because you will now do the cooperative things. Mm. Um, yeah. 
Right, okay. So here's just the, the um, progress they're doing training. So it just gives you an idea of how the, um, the, the rankings of them the, uh, went over time. So that's what I described just now is when it reaches the strong human level, when it reaches the average human. Um, so that's the agent in the paper the, for the win agent. This is the one I said um, earlier where they just had it um, playing on its own with no reward shaping and it couldn't learn anything. So with the sparse reward of getting an outcome at the end of the five minute game, no learning. Um, here is a slightly higher baseline where they did. So, so the only difference between this one and this one is the reward shaping. So the reward shaping itself actually <coughs> does a lot on its own. It can't get you to strong human level, but it gets you pretty close. Um, so then there's two more graphs um, missing from this that they didn't graph here. Um, and that is the slightly better versions of this one. So what they did is um, they took this one the in, in red, and then they added another um, version where they to use the population-based training that we described. Okay, and that one will do better. So, that, so that's up the next level up. And then the next higher level is the, the FTW agent, but without one of the key components, which we might discuss in a, in a little bit. Okay. Um, so these are just looking at the high parameters. Obviously, the learning rate going down is normally a, a good thing. You would expect to see it. We won't really discuss the other ones. This is sort of uh, how it's how um, how much time it's read so there's an, there's sort of a hierarchical LSTM and this is basically how it's it, it's tweaking how much time it's considering in terms of history for looking for patterns so in, in, in that's my intuitive explanation of it that's learning that as a hyperparameter um, due to the population based training okay yeah so those hyperparameters are just for the FTW agent in blue um, it's not applicable to the, the lesser um, agents. Okay, so this is what they actually see. So when I showed you the videos, that's not what they were trained on. That was just maybe when they were demonstrating what it does and they put it on a higher resolution. Um, so you can get it, so it looks nicer. But this is what they're being trained on, 84 by 84 pixels with three color channels. Um, and this is also what they used in, in previous work. So when they did the Atari games, they did the exact same 84 by 84 pixel. And that's actually quite interesting, but um, <coughs> that, they, that they, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how much more computing power it uses to use more um, pixels, but clearly it wasn't worth it. Um, it was more worth it to introduce more complexity in the structure of the neural network um, than to just do this to, to increase the, the, the definition. Did, did they mention about uh, how they come up with how they come up with the numbers 84 by 84? Um, no, but but like I said, they used it. So the Atari paper was um, the paper on Atari was in 2015. So they might actually uh, it, you know, with all the stuff, it's it's really usually just they tried something, they tried something else, and they saw this worked best. Mm. I mean, that's usually um, what happens. It it might also be that it um, w because it's a convolutional um, neural network, it, it it needs to look for little patterns. It learns to spot like edges and textures and things, and it could just be that as a resolution, they it could good, do a reasonable um, job. So I'm not sure about the actual reason, but it's. It's normally just them trying different things and, until they found something that worked. I'm guessing they probably tried different ones for this one as well, just to see, and then settled on what they've been doing always. Okay. Um, so this is what the agent can do, is they can turn left or right by 10 degrees or 60 degrees. They can look up or down by 5 degrees. They can strafe left or right. Um, they can go forward or backward. They can fire their rail gun, which is tagging, or they can jump. So, like I said before, the game can do 60 frames, but the agent is only running at 15 hertz. Um, and that's it, they can do action simultaneously. So they can turn right while jumping and firing and um, moving backwards. <laughs> so they can do everything simultaneously. So that's why there's 540 com composite actions. Okay. Um, so this is what I was referring to just now. So this was the 2015 paper. Um, just to show you how things have progressed. 
this is also DeepMind. And this was just learning to play uh, Breakout. And this is the same thing where um, you had the 84 by 84 resolution. It's a much simpler game, obviously, because it's not just because it's two-dimensional. Um, that's, not, that's not the only reason it's simple. The other reason it's simpler is because you, you have perfect knowledge of the world mm. in this sort of game. Whereas in the Quake Theory Arena, you, you don't know where, what's happening. Someone could be behind a wall, someone could be behind you, and you can't tell from the on-screen state what's happening. So here's where it's learning to um, just, you know, just randomly doing things, not having much success, but clearly learning something. So 120 minutes, I think that's on a GPU, um, but like one GPU, not, not like a whole... Um, <laughs> so it's getting better. Uh, and here's the thing where it's going to um, um, learn an even better way of doing it. Do? So now it's going to learn oh. that it should get the ball behind and it's going to... Brilliant. Yeah. S so in four years... Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in four, I guess more or less, I'm not sure if it's four oh, years, but they, they, they went from this to... Um, Oh yeah, that's two minute papers. Three papers. Yes, I, I, I came across this, I think, a couple of years back. Uh, someone from N NVIDIA actually gave a talk. Mm. Yep. I think the same thing. And then, and then I can't remember at exactly uh, what sort of learning it is going through, but it's, it's, a, it's actually, it became like, how, somehow it became very smart how it should play yeah. to the level whereby I think it's very difficult for a human to replicate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and they tried that with many games, and, and some didn't do so. Any games where, <coughs> so like Montezuma's Revenge, mm -hmm. is like you're on this screen, you go to the next, you pick up a key, you go back to the other screen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know that it's in a different state because it it's just sees the screen again and thinks it's in the same state, so it can't tell. Um, anyway, here's the network they used in this 25th. That was published in Nature in 2015. It's um. I mean, it's so simple that I can I can understand it, and I'm not a, <laughs> a professional in this, but I, it's it's very simple. I mean, it's ju it's just a bunch of on the right. I just said what the convolutional layers are. So all it's doing is it's being trained. So, so so the first thing you need to know is it's getting four frames at a time. Now the reason for that is just so that it can kind of know what the velocity is of the of the ball. So if or acceleration or anything else, it can tell that from four frames. So it has a perfect sort of state representation because one frame you can't tell anything about the velocity. So it doesn't need any memory of, of what, what came before. It just uses the four frames and it can derive it directly. Um, so it's a very simple set of convolutional networks. Um, so there's like an 8x8 eight eight one. So it just takes like an 8x8 eight eight tile and sweeps it across. And then with the back prop, it'll kind of learn what sort of thing it should have been looking for in that um, 8x8 tile. And then eventually it uh, gets some meaning from that. And the same with this um, 4x4 and 3x3 tile. So it can sort of maybe pick up like edges or maybe some texture or something. And there's a bunch of them. So there's 32 of these 8x8 tiles being slided. And then 64 of the 4x4 and 64 by 3 by 3 And then some fully connected layers at the end. Very simple, much simpler than the neural networks that are used for um, the advanced image classification. <coughs> so those are much, much deeper, um, a lot more going on. This is s actually super simple. I mean, when you, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's quite simple. But then we get to where we are now. Now, don't be scared of the legend on the right, but it's actually, it's, at, it's b gone to a whole new level now of um, complexity. <coughs> Now this blue, you can, now let's just quickly, the, the A on the top right, I'm not sure, oh, on the top left, so I'm not sure if everyone can see, but on the top left, um, it's telling you the overall architecture of the agent. And it consists of visual processing, recurrent processing, these auxiliary networks, and then the, um, the policies. And it's color coded. So this blue visual, um, visual embedding here corresponds to number D here. So this this is there. And this is actually what we, j almost exactly what we just saw. This component there in this paper 
is almost exactly what was used in uh, in that uh, in that Atari thing. So so that part is still useful, but they had to add a bunch of other things to actually get it to to do this, and it was you know a few years of extra um, research and things to get that working. Um, so the one thing they put in is so on the baseline agents they would put um, an LSTM which is just uh, like a recurrent neural network that allows it to sort of reason over time rather than just so it can have some 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 hidden state that it's carrying but then they also did something way more advanced um, which is a temporal hierarchy which is two LSTMs connected running at different um, time periods and I'm not going to go into all the details because it's just too much, but, um, and I don't know all the details myself. Um, but then they also did something else, which is that little um, hexagon there, the DNC memory. So they plugged the DNC memory into the LSTMs, and, um, and that little hexagon is um, this. So there's a whole other thing happening. So actually the architecture is quite a lot more complicated and this that hexagon is the differential neural computer which is just sort of learning to um, that was a 2016 paper by DeepMind and it's sort of it's learning how to save stuff at arbitrary locations or not arbitrary but it's learning to save bits of Im information in memory so that it can retrieve it again later um, it's more way more advanced than just an LSTM so it can retrieve again so it has a, a right head and it can learn to position that right head put some data in there and it can position a read head and then the read when it wants to and it can either keep the data there after reading it or it can delete it. So I'm not going to, I don't want to go into the detail of this because I, I didn't read the whole paper but it just shows you um, how much more complicated things have gotten in four years which is actually the point I want to bring across in this in this talk. So that hexagon plugged in there on the recurrent processing with temporal hierarchy you'll see it um, yeah, so you'll see it there in the variational unit at G, yeah. Okay, and that's the architecture comparison. And then they also took a few things from what the un Unreal Agent, which was from November 2016, which is those auxiliary networks, the pixel, pixel control and the reward prediction, and that just results in faster learning and improves performance. So that they could also run in Atari and just get like much faster learning, and also on this sort of 3D thing. Um, yeah, and I already discussed the temporal hierarchy and the um, the differential neural computer. So that's pretty much covers, gives you some, hopefully some sort of a sense of, of what's going on in terms of architecture. I'm not really going to go into the training methods used for this. Um, the training itself, so because the architecture, so when you look at the stuff, you see the architecture, you think this is this is what's happening, this is a neural network, but actually there's a whole different algorithm for um, how do you train this? Like how do you um, get the right actions and view them correctly and store all the right Q values for the right states? All that stuff, it, it becomes, and, and recently, like a few days ago, they published a bit of, um, of code for this. Um, I think on Thursday or Friday, they when they published this in Science, they published some code and it's a zip file and it contains two files. Um, one is called pseudocode.pdf and the other one is called pseudocode.py. So you can get, you can choose if you want Python pseudocode or not. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was that. And then, and that was, that's most of it. And then just one short little note on this is they also, so they found that the agents do well and part of why they do well is, could be explained by the fact that they're just faster than humans. So they have better reaction time. So they said, well, what if we, what if we handicapped mm -hmm. the agent a little bit and said, um, we're going to give them a 267 millisecond delay. And um, you'll see the results of that here. So what you want to look at is you want to compare maybe the strong human performance mm -hmm. against delayed agent um, opponent. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that um, it's still performing quite well when you, when you compare it. So that, that still means that only 20% of the time the strong humans could win after they delayed it. So they couldn't just explain the um, the performance purely by faster reaction times, and that's most of it. That's pretty much it. I can, if you if you guys want, I can just quickly show you some part of the video um, um, that accompanies this that they that they released. Um, so I already showed you that. 
Um, let's see if there's anything. So here's just an illustration of how they're training everything concurrently, right? So, so that's just the, to give you an idea. I mean, it's just like a, just to, to give you an idea. Yeah, like someone, they must be having, they must have someone full time just doing, yeah. or a few people full time just doing these graphics, you know. Cool this is how it's growing, so that you can see those are the 30 agents, those dots, and you can see how they're progressing over time. That's 20,000 games, um, mm. that's how they perform. Yeah. So I can probably find something more interesting. Let's see. Here they kind of try to analyze the reward signal to decode, to decode it. Mm -hmm. So they try to decode um, um, what the agent is, is ha what's happening inside the agent, and it's a bit more interesting when you look sorry there was another mm. I mean these as well give you a sort of a neural response map mm -hmm. and then that's pretty much I mean just trying to give an idea that I mean that it's there's actually which you'd expect it that there are ac sections of the network that are responsible for certain behaviors you'd expect that but just trying to show that yeah you can we can also do this graphically and give you an idea um, and then the rest of this video is just sort of an some games being played and it just gives you an idea of the behaviors that that emerge so <coughs> you, you can just watch you can just watch this video yourself and that's it that's all i got Incredible. so that last architectural diagram that you showed us is it applicable to all kinds of um first person visual games um I think they can. Uh, they, they've refined it so well that it's usable for most I'm, games. I'm not sure if the, if they've applied it. So when they did that stuff with Atari, they will they would they then applied it to all the, the like a bunch of Atari games. With yeah, this, I'm not. Sh like I'm that. not sure with this, but what they did with this, yeah, I think mostly it's all on the same engine. So they did try and do it on different types of games. So not just. So they built their own games inside Quake, like something called Labyrinth, where it needs to sort of go and find things or I'm, I'm not sure which is not like like this team type game but as far as I can see they haven't adapted it to other first person games but yeah it could work cool the, the train, so the training the 1000 over is actually all on a different layout right the map yeah, so they generate all these, every time they generate, and there's also, I didn't cover this, there's also different size maps as well. So they make, um, they make them, um, yeah, uh, they make different sizes of maps, a bit bigger as well, and they generate new maps, and they also kept some maps separate for uh, validation purposes, um, so that they are sure that maybe those are maps that the agent haven't seen before when they want to validate it, yeah. Whoops. Navigating through the mazes <laughs> is not easy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, knowing how to get to from your base to the opponent's base, and then knowing how to that you must reverse that direction mm. to get back. That is that is quite impressive. Yeah. So. Yes, the temporal but, can, but in some parts of it, like what you were asking earlier about how much they can reuse, I mean, the, 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 the first bit of it was what you said was exactly the Atari, no, it was the... Yeah, it was the, the uh, Atari, yeah. The, uh, network, right? And then the they kind of tacked on all these things at the end. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't call it the end anymore. It's just like, they took that as a front end and they put all these other things uh, together. To, to So I guess one way you could think of it as Maybe it will not. It, even if mean, if it may not work for all kinds of two D shooter, three D shooter games, it could potentially be a a starting location where you start tweaking from here yeah. to maybe. But the back end of the diagram was complicated. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It looks very specialized mm. for certain aspects of some games. Uh, but this is the first time I see from DeepMind they have a very. <coughs> 
uh, business opportunity to to derive from what they have done. So it's like, for example, uh, for for war games, uh, for the military, they always have for mm. war games. What what is the best way to move my so soldiers, mm. tanks? Mm. There's a, there's one opportunity. Another op opportunity is that they will have u using maybe the similar en engine to figure out what is the best way for me to actually uh, get my people working in the factory. What, what, what's, what's the best way so that I can get the most efficient um, work, the most productivity based on this setup. But you need example videos to show it. Yeah, correct. Right. So yeah, un unless you unless you mounted it on a on a on a trailer with a camera and let it walk around and then until it but yeah i mean then we, then we need to find some sort of remember reinforcement learning you do need a, re a reward so you it would need some sense of for this i mean there are lots of <coughs> sort of uh, machine learning algorithms but for this specific one you do need some sort of reward and or not only that you, you as you started saying earlier it can't be a reward that you get at the end of the things you got you have to make have some mechanism to get the reward yeah. uh, continuously through uh, the, the process, right? Yeah, it can't be too sparse. Um, yeah, can't yeah. Be too sparse. Yeah. But, but for the factory stuff, I think there's a lot of people working on that. I think there's probably better, better ways of, of doing that. I've seen, uh, actually, there's a talk at Paper Speed Love as well uh, about dealing with uh, routing of robots within an automated <coughs> factory or, a, or automated supermarket picking, like Amazon warehouse pick, robot picking. Uh, algorithm, so navigation algorithm for a robot that's like going to a warehouse and picking things. So there's that 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 stuff is there's, there's already <coughs> that's a very but different solution than this. But it's not as complicated <coughs> as, as as what they have done. So yeah, it doesn't need to be this complicated. Though. Yeah, that yeah. One probably a much simpler solution. I mean, if you if you if you want if you wanted something to I learn, you the same engine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you want, I mean, if you want something to learn your warehouse layout, then obviously you, you would need this sort of visual, because this is a very visual yeah. neural network, right? It's v very much based on on vision. That's why the first part of the network is just uh, the same as the. It's just a, v a visual um, convolutional network. Yeah. But it, you know, other problems maybe you, you you maybe wouldn't apply this if you could get a model of the world. Yeah. So if you can get a schematic yeah. of your where else? Or you can uh, have some mechanism to bring in some location data of your agent's 3D location within the, the schematic. Yeah, if it, yeah, or you can get location rather than it having to know. But yeah, I mean, but vision. But yeah, I still think the vision can probably be applied to many um, problems once we have um, once we have a few more years of uh, research and because um, some of these algorithms also make it more efficient um, that they've been doing. So maybe in a few years we'll be able to apply vision to more problems than we we thought. Hopefully, um, that that'll be cool. Yeah, I, I, I just thought of something. Maybe can I actually use this and apply it into basketball games in terms of strategy. Mm -hmm. Like certain pe people are that their strength in s certain thing. How do I actually actually put in a strategy to to win it? So you can actually put in these to achieve. Think of strategy whereby no humans they can actually think of. Actually, yeah. uh, think okay. about it. Uh, there have been some startup try try to especially in the uh, esports. Uh, I think for esports game, those e type playing complex games kind. Of, there have been some companies trying to use uh, AI to really help them to win in the <laughs> esports. Uh. There's also the those um, dogs. The what is it called? The Weibo dogs or something, where they sort of um, they're these robot little robot dogs, and they it's a it's an AI challenge, and they but they're actual physical robot dogs, and they they, they have play like they play soccer, and they and I think it's also reinforcement um, learning. Yeah, um, robot soccer. Yeah, and that's like a yeah. That's that sport in in a sense. <laughs> yeah. More complex version of that AWS uh, thing. They have a sport nowadays. They do it at every of their conference events where they have these little robot cars and these are go around oh. the track. Oh, okay. Mm. Forget the name. Something.
something challenge or something. I, I saw it. Isn't it the Jetson challenge? No. 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 This one is like uh, you just you just train the network, and then the the inference runs on the car Free itself. Free scale is somehow involved. No. Maybe they might be doing for us. Yeah. I can't remember why. Yeah, but it's fun. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming. Today yeah, I learned a lot. So much. <laughs> they actually share the codes. Some some of the codes have what they have done so far. Mm. Yeah, recently they put out a bit of code. Um, you can find, just go, just Google DeepMind. Um, DeepMind has been sharing quite a bit of things.